Welcome to the podcast. My name is Chris Hall, your host, and today I've got a returning guest, Daniel Mumby. Now, Daniel Mumby is an angel investor, 15 times startup founder, and he's a LinkedIn top voice, a author, and also a professional that helps mentor and coach uh, people that are both wanting to come out of their professional careers into entrepreneurship and also entrepreneurs that are going along their journey. I find this gentleman quite fascinating, but very fascinating. He's an absolute gun in the entrepreneurship world and really has a ability to think about the big picture and the trends. So Dan Mumby, welcome back to the podcast. I'm really keen to connect with you today. G'day, Chris. Thanks for having me back. It's been a, it's been a little while since we've had a chance to have a chat. And uh, wow, aren't we in a brave new world? Don't we just? I mean, yeah. So I want to kind of uh, frame the title of today's discussion as the new problems that businesses will solve. Now, we're recording this in mid-May 2020, um, and we are still in the pandemic and the global you know, context of uh, COVID-19 and all that jazz. And um, there are some different uh, uh, situations for Australia versus the world. But regardless of that, there's a general global cultural uh, phenomenon going on um, as well. And there's also a big business um, phenomenon going on in the context of that. So, um, you know, if we're going to talk about what business can do, I feel like business is here to solve problems. Um, and I think that there's also a limit to what governments can do. And, and I think that within those limits, it therefore pushes us towards potential opportunity in terms of the new solutions that businesses can bring. So I'm going to start off this conversation with an interesting um, hypothetical question. So here we go. Um, Dan, if I was to give you a million dollars and you have to invest that million dollars, what industries would you not touch with a barge pole? That's a very British expression. Wouldn't touch it with the six foot barge pole. It means I wouldn't go near it. Okay. What would you just not go near right now, even if you had, you had to invest that money? And remembering I'm from the same other country, so I know the expression very, very well. So um, what would I not touch with a barge pole? I'd love to. I'd love it if the second question is, what would you do with it? Because I, I actually think I have the perfect answer for that. And I think you'll love the answer. But here's, here's where I wouldn't go. Um, if everybody's going left, I'm looking for the gap and spaces that have been created on the right. Everyone is going into health and medical at the moment and making face masks and all of that sort of thing, and pers personal PPE stuff, personal protective equipment. Um, that's not a sustainable business model because at some point um, the market will either be saturated by everyone that's going to that space um, and, uh, and, and then the, the, it'll be a race to the bottom. So I would not be putting my money into building a sustainable, scalable, disruptive business model around building PPE. And in fact, anyone that I see that's doing that, it means that the, one of two things has happened. Either they had no viable value proposition themselves and all this uh, crisis has created has has revealed that they have no viable model or secondly they're an opportunist that can't realize that everybody else around them is an opportunist as well who's running to that space um, so th this is the this is the wonderful opportunity when people get to prove whether their model actually works now and can they make it work in a difficult time and wonderfully um, all of the the businesses that you were trying to break, all the business models that you were trying to disrupt with your own business model have now been broken. So there were, there were businesses that I'm targeting that I thought would take uh, within our venture studio model. I'll tell you what a venture studio is in a sec. Uh, within our venture studio model um, that we think would take us 10 years to disrupt. Those businesses have already been disrupted. We can now get to success in two years instead of 10 on our strategic plans. One of the spaces that I like is around professional services, hmm. accountants, lawyers, tax planners, financial advisors, uh, investment consultants, property consultants, um, uh, 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 estate planning, any, anything that, that involves the management of people's ventures and or money and the collaboration and connection of different types of advice that goes with that. Let me tell you why. Let's pick one problem. You start a new business. So you go to a lawyer, an accountant, and a tax planner. And those three people will give you three different pieces of advice on the basic structure of your business based upon their expertise um, because they all have a different focus. So the difficulty now is that you as a business operator have to figure out how to centralize that information at the three different types of business advice and say, well, do I want to set up my business to maximize my income, to maximize my tax structure, or to protect my IP, all three of which are different structures. 
and there is no central point where I'm getting common advice as an ordinary person. Perhaps if I'm a VHP, I can get it because I can afford the big fees. But as an individual, solopreneur, small business person, small operator, um, one man band, call it whatever you will, um, there's nowhere I can get consistent advice. Those professional spaces are absolutely right for disruption right about now. And the smart operators are going to figure that. Hmm. That's interesting. That and I agree with that very much so because um, like as a business coach, time and time again, um, with my clients, it might be that they go, oh, I spoke to my accountant and he told me this, or oh, I was thinking about this and what do you reckon about the legal bit? And, you know, and if none of that fits together into a holistic vision of where you want to take the business, what the mission is and how you're going to get there and all that stuff and how you're going to bring your team along, you know, not, if, if it's too myopic, um, then yeah. if the point is myopic, then you miss the whole point of how you holistically bring together. And I use the word holistic as, you know, the, the meaning of the all yeah. connected parts. Yeah. It's, but it's really easy. I mean, who's, who's got a pain? Are they willing to act in a way to relieve that pain? Are they accessible? Can you reach them? Can they afford to pay? And will they be willing to pay for your service? And the sixth question I like to ask is what, what will turn them into raving fans? And, and because if they're raving fans, they become, uh, you achieve Nirvana state of word of mouth marketing, but it, mm. but it becomes advocacy and it becomes um, lunacy in terms of promotion for you. You don't, you no longer have to spend a dollar on cost of acquisition of clients if your clients are doing that for you. So, so the whole model is um, for that. How can I do that in the PPE space? I've got no deep domain knowledge. I've got no connections, no track record, no credibility, no equipment, no machinery, but I'm going to repurpose my whole business model into doing that, or I'm going to change my whole business strategy to doing something in that space. I, I couldn't think of a bigger recipe for failure than that space. So, so if there's, if, if, if you're asking the short answer to the question, where would I not go? I would not be opportunistic. I would double down on where I was going trying to figure out whether the market that I'm solving the problem for cares and is willing to pay mm -hmm. and, and am I solving their real pain, their real compelling problem. Right, that's really good that's distinction there. Don't, I, <laughs> ironically, don't drop, don't just jump on opportunism um, because if it's not your area, area of deep domain, it's not sustainable, um, it's not authentic and actually it's not gonna, it's not gonna last. Um, so that's a very good point. I mean, I think that there are also um, some industries that face distinct challenges, of course, and there's a long list of them. You know, like sure, things like um, you know, grocery food retailers had, had a boom, PPEs had a boom, various things have had a boom, but there's a quite yep. a long list of industries, whether it be the airline or the live events, sports, concerts. Um, you know, so for example, um, you know, I work as a speaker um, in the conference and events industry. So right now, that is royally, absolutely buggered um, because it's, you know, people are not yet anywhere near even willing to um you know they're not thinking about how you can bring people together in the same physical room because there's all this you know should we say very fervent belief that we still need to be social distancing and that indeed is still a policy so we're so far off from what we might traditionally think of as normal right so you know if i was uh, saying what would i not touch with the barge pole i wouldn't invest in a cafe a restaurant uh, an event business um you know you know various things universities infrastructure commercial property uh, residential property, uh, la la la. Um, so I, I like what you said about the event space. I um, so 18 months ago, just over, yeah, just over 18 months ago, I uh, uh, sorry, two years ago, I started a program around an investor conference about getting investors into the early stage market in Australia, and failed dismally at it. And thank God I did, because if I had succeeded on my first time out, uh, I'd be I'd be stuffed now. That's a right. particular Australian expression. Um, so I'd be or I'd be buggered. Uh, sorry, because royally, I mean, because the problem is, if you succeed at a conference and event business and it gets good, the only way for you to grow is to roll the dice again, bigger, better. Right. And you roll the dice again. You go to more locations. You scale it. You bring in bigger speakers. You set up bigger cost structures, and you end up with a structure where. Okay, it sort of worked. We made a little bit of money. We'll reinvest that in. We'll reinvest it in. We'll reinvest it. Now I've got a huge business, and this thing's basically rolled me over, and it's unsustainable because it's a rinse and repeat business. It's not a. It's not necessarily a scalable, replicable business in the same way that we would build it. So, um, that, so let's, I'm, let's, I'm let's glad tap I into that. That's an interesting point you're bringing up there. So rinse and repeat um is is one mode of business and then you've got what you're saying is scalable so let, let's is this about the um 
what are the, the, the underlying value that you, is it about having that higher sense of value? What, what is it that, how, what, what's the contrast? You've got rinse and repeat, which I think you're, you know, good, nice kind of beginning of a description there, but what's the alternative path that, that, that's not rinse well, and repeat? I, okay. So, so I like, I look to history successes as, and failures as examples yeah. of new models. Um, so, so I did say I was going to tell you about the Venture Studio and I'll tell you why that matters. I'm, I'm looking for systematization and process um, that can allow me, can free me up to be creative within design rather than have to force to be creative within the construction process. And Henry Ford back in um, uh, the 1907 or what have you was making cars like a hundred other people were, Daimler, Benz, what have you. And his father uh, and a couple of other... Um, I'm trying to think of the guy. C. Harold. What? Uh, there's a guy. There's a guy I'm thinking of that actually helped him as well, who, who was working for Ford. Said, "Why are you building cars one at a time? Why don't you build factories to build cars? Because then the then the the freedom and fun functionality goes into the design of the, the what have you. The systematization then is the thing that matters, um, and and that's that's where I'm looking to do. So, are you an artisan building products one at a time, or are you a um, a, a craftsman designer um, who then systematizes the process. And that's, if you're gonna build a scalable, disruptive, replicable, repeatable business model, you need to figure out how to stop being an artisan, which is, which is great. I mean, there's nothing, everybody wants mm -hmm. to be Da Vinci, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the, getting it down and breaking the process into its systematized parts, and then being able to invite people who are not crazy entrepreneurs like us to contribute at their point in the journey of their expertise, which is for, for a great many people is they're, they're good at one good thing. And that's nothing wrong with that. They're not um, like, uh, uh, they, often a lot of people I mean, are, are, are not T-shaped where they're very wide across a lot of things and perhaps very deep at one or two or three or four things. Um, for entrepreneurs who are that. For most people, they're very good at one thing. Yep. And, and so we need systems and processes that invite the normal mass of people in to play in our model at the space where they are. Good point. And so what you're describing the is, is, the, is the role of the entrepreneur to be the design thinker, to go above the, the, the rinse and repeat. He's is, is, is talking about like, don't be, as the entrepreneur, don't be, that's partly don't be in the delivery of the rinse and the repeat. It's going beyond that exactly. and bringing in. And yeah, be, okay, so being a business owner, not an operator is another uh, you know, common phrase, right? You know, so it's things like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Taking it, elevating up to design. Working on the business, not in it. So the yeah. innovation is in the design of the process and the systematization, the replicability. If you can design a system, for instance, what Henry Ford was, the analogy was very simple. Why are you building cars one at a time? Why aren't you building mm. systems and processes that build the cars and systems and processes? And in doing so, what you're doing is actually, you're enabling additional entrepreneurship because for Henry Ford to make his model work right, he couldn't just set up his own factories. He also had to work with other companies who'd also set up systematization and, and got the innovation in the design process, not in the manufacturing. Um, so his headlight guys had to be systematized. He couldn't buy from a hundred different headlight manufacturers who were artisan. He had to build or buy his products and services that were systematized. The result of that was that he also created systems that flowed from his business. The process of road construction, the process of petrol stations, the process of fuel distribution, the process of um, uh, automobile vehicle licensing. Now, why does that all matter? Because what most people understand about what Henry Ford did and what, what other great entrepreneurs do is when they get their model right, the, the impact and the flow on from what they do is transformative. Mm. And before 1910 in America, before 1905 in America, most people born and lived and died within about a five kilometre radius, or sorry, five mile radius. Mm. And that was where they spent their life. And the reason for that is because five or six miles was about as far as a horse could go there and back in a day. So that's what happened. Suddenly with the introduction of the motor vehicle, not only was the transportation of goods um, fundamentally changed, but the transform, transformation of American society of where people would live. They could now travel 50 or 60 miles in a day instead of five or six. And it opened up vast tracts of the American Midwest and, the, the, in fact, the whole of the American US um, uh, nation. So people were able to now live and work where the opportunities were because mm. they could get there. Mm. Now, if you create a business model that is replicable and scalable, your 
opportunity is to fundamentally transform that industry with the partners that you're working with and then the flow on fundamental transformative effects of your audience are generational changing. It's known as a paradigm shift and we are at the, the mother of all paradigm shifts right now. Um, I call this a once in 500 year generational, it's not just a generational event, it's a once in 500 year event. It is like the combination of the beginning of the Renaissance, the beginning of the industrial era and the fall of Rome all at the same time, all bundled into one place. Mm. And nobody knows how to handle it. Nobody knows. Everybody's feeling stressed and overwhelmed. And, and yet, for people like you and I, Chris, this is situation normal for us, mm. even though it's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. Most great entrepreneurs that I know are going, oh, my God, this is the reset that we wanted. And now we get to play at to our strengths because we're already at stage eight of the seven stages of grief when everybody else was at stage two or three. And, and I don't mean to sound mean when I say that. I just recognize the fact that for most entrepreneurs, we've been preparing for this our whole lives. Yeah, really good point, my gosh. And I think as both entrepreneurs and as individuals, we're at this pivotal point indeed where um, I feel like it is kind of like a crossroad. It, I fully agree, yeah. it's a paradigm shift. And I love that. Oh, there's a few things I wanna say. The Henry Ford example there, the, the business, provided the ultimate value of a paradigm shift to freedom to move around a cold country and um, by a road. You know, that was the paradigm shift of everything you just said. And so that's one of the things that, that's what the customer got. It wasn't that they got a car with wheels that you put petrol in and, you know, and the wheels move around. It's the paradigm shift of freedom of, of, of movement. Um, so gosh, and then take that paradigm shift idea now to the fork in the road and the fork in the road that I see is that I'm going to just be frank here. We can either live in a world of fear and uh, you know and control and lack of privacy and have be trampled on um, in terms of you know governmental control, or we can I go heard that. <laughs> right. Or we can go. I'm just I'm being passionate here because there are certain things I care yeah. about right now. Um, you know, or we can go down a road of saying, yeah, health matters and all this stuff. And, you know, yeah, sure, we want to avoid outbreaks and you know all of these things matter. That's fine. We can acknowledge that they matter, but we won't put up with an invasion of privacy. We won't put up with being, uh, having a police state globally. We won't put up with being trampled on in terms of our civil liberties and rights. And therefore, entrepreneurs and individuals have an opportunity to walk down a much brighter path. And that's actually- An obligation. You know, and so it's so it down to the choices of the individual yeah. and the entrepreneur. Don't roll over right now. This is why it's a shift. It can go in two sort of ways. And it's gonna be democracy, should we say, in terms of how many people are gonna go down the dark path of just accepting this shit, and how many people are going to go down the, the other way, which is a bit more of a let's do something a bit differently and cause a paradigm shift for the better. <laughs> um, I feel um, like that that is the road that I want to go down. So you've actually got me passionate now. Like, dude, let's connect on that. <laughs> oh, I, 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 OK, so let me let me tell you why I agree with you. And because because I'm, I think we're in, we're in furious agreement here. I'm a, I'm a, uh, a, a libertarian. I am a nationalist. Uh, yes. I'll make no mistake about that. Yep. But, uh, and and uh, I'm an anti-authoritarian. I'm an, an, an entrepreneur. Um, so I fundamentally believe in the ability of the individual to create the state that we want to all live in and mm. to be able to see that. Um, so the, the problem with being all three of those is I'm typically hated by unions, socialists, um, and, <laughs> and any, anyone who believes that this is an opportunity for the, for, the, uh, for, for the government to solve all of our problems, not right. the individual. So just plugging some power into a device, so apologies. Hang on, we can probably edit this out if we have to. No, you're all good, it's all part of the flow. But okay, by the way, <laughs> I, I want to relate to that. I feel the same, I'm exactly the same. Libertarian, i.e. minimal government. I do believe in the pride of having a nation. I also believe in, um, I, I would say I'm a constitutionalist, but I'm not so sure about Australia's actual constitution. What I do love about is the classic version of the American constitution and the Bill of Rights and all the things that that truly enshrines. And I think that that is, um, is the natural rights of humanity expressed in a document. It's just that we're not living as we could fully. But yeah, okay, let's connect. This is brilliant. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're definitely on the same page. So that, um, hang on, sorry, let's pause. We can always edit out two minutes. I just want to make sure because this is such an important conversation, I, I want to absolutely make sure that we've got power going on here. Uh -huh. um, there we go. I think we're okay now. Sorry, sorry about that, Chris. Um, you, I, I, you know what? I think what you're, what you're saying is really, really important. I mean, we're on a crest of a wave now. We either take the opportunity as it comes or we lose it. We're, we're both financially and, and culturally and economically and socially 
at, at, at one of two points. We're either at the beginning of the 1920s or the 1930s. In my mind, we're at the beginning of the roaring 20s, again, which is from 100 years ago, or we're at the beginning of what will become the worst, the, this will become the greater depression. Yes. You know, unemployment is already predicted to see unemployment rates of 26, 27, even potentially 30%. We could see drops in GDP of 20%. So the risk is, of course, that socially and culturally and economically and politically, that we move to an authoritarian state, that we... That we We move either to, to complex the answers to the problems, which is completely wrong, um, or we're at the opportunity where we get to rebuild our society again in the way that we want it as a society and as a people, and as we choose to, and we don't do it, uh, you know, you look what happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall with Russia and they become essentially controlled by oligarchs. They didn't get rid of uh, communism, they just changed how it was delivered. The communism was delivered by corporations rather than, than by the state, but it, it's still technically a communist society. People aren't really free to do what they want. Um, and we risk the, the scenario where, where Australia moves from being a mercantile or an oligarchical community ourselves. I mean, you think about it, every industry that we have is essentially controlled by two major players. Supermarkets, banks, banks is different because they've got four, um, but, but supermarkets, telco, um, your gas, water, power is all controlled by one organisation. And to some extent, our politics is two organisations. It's the blue team or the, rest, the red team. Who do you vote for? And, and so we need, we have this wonderful opportunity to change the game, but we have to change the game. Mm -hmm. So if everything is broken and you have to rebuild it, why not rebuild it to the thing that you want to rebuild it to be? Why don't we build a truly representative political system? Why don't we build an inclusive financial and economic system that leaves nobody behind, that takes care of the people who need it, but also encourages people to contribute, to aspire, to, in, to inspire and, and, and to share in the upside. You know, changing the fundamental structure of business so that we, instead of taxing people for the uh, equity that they have in a country as if it was salary, what if we found a way, okay, we can't pay your salary at the moment because we're in a depressed economy. What if instead of us paying you less, we paid you the same, but we paid you some in cash and some in equity, and now you're an owner of the business and you feel like you have a valuable contribution to make. Why does that matter? Because if, if, if employees owned 20% of the company, you would find that there would not be a disparate pay gap between what the lowest paid or the average CEO, sorry, the average employee is being paid and the CEO is being paid because now the CEO would technically work for the employees. The, C, the, the employees would have the casting vote on um, at a shareholder meeting, for instance, and would be able to exercise that. So we, you know, if we have the ability to encourage employees to own companies, not just through their super funds, but directly mm. as a part of their salary package, you would find that suddenly maybe managers that actually start listening to employees and maybe employees would start paying attention to what management is actually doing because, hey, it's my company too. There's a great name for a business. It's my company too. <laughs> I, I, and, 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 isn't, and that's just one of a hundred things that I could pick with yep. you, Chris, in talking about this, about how we might change um, the, the society um, culturally. Um, I think we're on the crest of a wave. And, and as I said, it's the beginning of the 20s or the beginning of the 30s. Yep. But either one of those, it's still the beginning, I'd like to think, of the Australian century. The next hundred years could be the most prosperous for our nation that we've ever experienced since the gold rush of the 1850s, 1860s. Before we were even a country, we were, tip, we were, we were flagged to be, now at least I've got this anecdotally, I'd, I'd have to look at the evidence, but we were technically the richest nation in the world in the 1850s before we were even a nation. Right. So the opportunity for us to rise again and go back from being on the G20 and maybe back up G4, G5, is there and waiting for us if we choose to do something about it. Oh, I completely agree. Um, and yeah. Yeah. As you can see, a good analogy to the New Deal in the 20s, sorry, the 1930s and the, and the, and the 20s. Um, you know, for those who you know, that aren't familiar with the history, you had Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1930s doing the New Deal program. The New Deal program lasted for several, several years and it was government's intervention to say, you know, things, everything from 
come and work on this farm and do food production or come and do this thing, but you've got to operate your business in this manner. And in theory, it was generating jobs and, and economic things. But there have been some interesting arguments that I've listened to recently that actually the New Deal program was the very thing that prolonged um, the Great Depression. And so I also think that from a policy point of view, we're also at that fork in the road because, you know, um, on average, if you look at central banking and government debt right now, um, most countries around the world have taken a roughly about 20% of extra debt through central banking and government, um, you know, programs. Are you through the corner programs that they did through the last 10 years? Uh, well, well, exactly. So the point is, is that right now, I think we're at the risk of ex extra risk of stagflation. So we've already got unemployment yes. spiking and we've got yep. all this extra money coming into the system. So we've got a massive, so stagflation for those that don't know is unemployment and inflation. And it's a deadly yep. cocktail, deadly cocktail. And, and very hard to fix. Yeah. From the 1970s. And the, and the cause of that will be rising prices on the things that people have to buy, which form the basis of CPI, which is what they uh, work out rising prices on. So food's going up. Uh, fuel, not, but it will. Actually, <laughs> fuel in Australia is ridiculous because it's being artificially propped up by collusion and collaboration. Um, you know, I don't know why the ACCC is not in that. Electricity prices, um, gas prices, energy, water, all the things that insurance, all the things that we have to buy are actually going to go up, not down. Mm. And so, therefore, the drivers for inflation are there, even though the economy is producing less. So we have a, a, a scenario where the things we have to buy go up in price, but the economy is stagnant or in fact exactly. dropping. Exactly. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I think you spotted it. I, I definitely think that the, the risk is there that we'll have a decade of stagflation, which is, which is worse than the Great Depression in terms of what it is, because it, 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 it means that people have less spending power to be able to do things. Well, exactly. Not exactly. And, now, and now you can tackle that, um, you know, depending on one's point of view of the world, you can tackle that through alternative contrarian investment strategies. But rather than talking about gold or cryptocurrencies here, because that would be like a whole other discussion, that's investment, yeah. right? I want to focus on entrepreneurship and what businesses can do. So um, let's talk about empires here for a second, right? So like yeah. the Roman Empire, when it fell, um, at Rome yeah. at the time, let me get the statistic right, had a population of around um, 1 million. And when the Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, it then dropped yep. to 500,000 and then it was 35,000 by the Middle Ages. So the reason I tell that statistic is that in this environment of having viruses and all this stuff and authoritarianism rising and all this stuff that, frankly, even though a lot of people won't admit it, because um, if you admit that you're annoyed with this stuff, you get shut down by all the people that think that, um, you know, that it's a good thing. Um, but I think... Yeah, I think the the people, pile on politics... They jump oh, on you. Oh yeah, yeah shaming. Yeah. It's shaming. So it's like if you dare to say like we should we shouldn't be in this um, or like you know we shouldn't live in a police state or we or we shouldn't um, have a lockdown. There's no, there is no pandemic in Australia. Ninety seven deaths. You know things. Like, if you say that, it's like <gasps> how dare you? you well, know? I would I wouldn't say the last one, but I'm quite comfortable in saying all of the others because I've been a political activist now for over twenty years, and totally. and I don't care. <laughs> so so for me. I, it's a part of who I am, and and I don't care that that's, that that somebody somebody will jump on me and 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 try and 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 then the impact is to hurt my business interests because I don't care because I'm building a level of resilience into my business model that doesn't allow me to be damaged by by people that disagree with me. And be, be, between by being a centrist libertarian, I'm hated by the left, hated by the right anyway, yeah. so I'm used to it. <laughs> well, well so, good point. So, but but the, right. the, the reason I say that that kind of like little bit of a rant from my part there is that is that I want to say that there are going to be some people that might not vocalize that they're dissatisfied right now. Um, and I think, yeah. and, and the reference to the Roman Empire is that the trend was that cities at the fall of empires, whether it be military or economic, at the fall of empires, there's a trend to move to suburbia, literally to go more regional and to kind of go like, no, nah, I'm not into this city stuff. There's either got the cops harassing me or I've got, you know, things that I don't want happening in my life. And it also seems like a more dangerous place. Like, look at New York. So if people are going to, you know, be freaking out about what could happen to them. And, for the, you know, if they look at New York and what happened there with death rates and COVID-19 and all that stuff, yeah. they'll be like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to live in the city anymore. So do you think there might be an interesting trend of regional suburbia migration? And how could business fit into that? Well, he's, yes, you're absolutely right. So here's the thing. We, we have jobs in cities because that's where the jobs are and that's where the people are. But if you have a system, a scenario where everybody's used to working from home yeah. and, in fact, industries being digitised, if you will, 
Yeah. Um, if the lawyer has to learn how to deliver a service online and the accountant does and the and the the person who works for the big insurance company or the bank or the petrol petrol company or the uh, whatever the, the services company, if they're used to now delivering their services from home, then why do they actually have to live and work in the most expensive cities in the world? Why can't they? Why can't we decentralise our businesses? Because the problem is people can't move to the regions because there's no jobs, but they want the lifestyle. The the lip service that we've paid as a society to see change and tree change has literally just been that. I mean, we talk about it, but the stats don't bear out the number of people that have moved to the regional areas versus net immigration where most people are uh, essentially wanting to move to Melbourne and Sydney. Now, I know that governments try and move them to regional areas, but in reality, that's, that's ineffective. Um, there are some great regional communities out there that are growing, but like Shepparton. But um, why do we have why do we have cities in in Australia that are an average population in the regions of twenty, thirty, forty thousand people? When in the US, it's not uncommon for to have city. In fact, you know they've got two hundred cities over you know three hundred thousand people each. We should have twenty, thirty, forty, fifty cities that are two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand people each take the pressure off the capital cities, gently burst the property bubble instead of it having to explode, because mm -hmm. there is. The, the problem, of course, is that state governments are addicted to the revenue streams that they get from um, uh, property growth, because they're able to centralise their uh, expenses like infrastructure development, and they're able to, to um, uh, they're addicted to the to money that they make from it. You now they get the, the um, property tax, uh, they get uh, uh, rates at state and federal level, they get the, um, uh, the stamp duty from property transactions, and they get the GST from construction from new home sales. Um, so of course they want to do that, and, and they can centralise how much they've got to spend. So their, their, econ their income's up here, and their expenses are down here. If you move everybody to a regional basis, it goes the other way. So they get less on the income side and I have to spend more because I got to spend more building the infrastructure that doesn't exist mm, as point. opposed to just adding on to it. The, the problem is that's the right thing to do for Australia. Right. But unless we tell the governments that's what we want, they're never going to do it because they're not leaders. They don't know how to lead and they don't have a 50 year vision. And that's the thing that is missing in Australia. We have no 50 year plan for the country and we need one. And we need somebody to step up and say, Here's where we can go as a nation. And I don't care, and, and forget which political party you're talking about. Greens, Labor, Liberal, even the sense of some of the minor parties don't have a vision. What we need is somebody to step forward with a vision and say, here, here's where we're going. And then people will follow with that. Because, mm. hey, that's actually pretty good. That's the sort of country that I want for my kids or my grandkids or for my family's uh, family. You know, the next generations, that, what do we want to see? We get to choose now. This is the beauty of it. But will we choose? That's mm -hmm. the interesting question. And I don't know that we will. Yeah, gosh. I mean, I love the political vision. And my, but my, in addition to that, my distinction will be that consumers ultimately drive economies still. And so the reason I brought up this whole thing about, you know, are people in the pressure cooker, are they getting maybe perhaps either pissed off or scared of cities? And therefore, you know, through their own consumeristic behavior, regardless of incomes and expenditures of city governments or regional governments, will they just go, sod it, I'm moving to the coast, I'm moving to Shepparton, I'm moving to wherever, I'm moving to the Blue Mountains, I can get property there, I can get acreage there, I can, you know, I can, I can make my own choice about environmentalism and beliefs around that, I can get solar, I can get batteries, you know, if this happens again, don't worry about lockdown because I'll have five acres for the kids to run around on. That's what I've thought of already. Like I live on the central coast north of Sydney. I'm, I live in a, in a house, um, but I'm already kind of thinking, oh, God, I want a few acres now. Like, you know, I want, I want to keep on getting the, all this kind of stuff happening so that I am personally, business-wise, shielded from whatever stuff people decide to do. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing at the moment, and, and I'm going to be really controversial here, and, and I'm going to offend some people by saying this, but at the moment, climate change is now technically solved. Look, look around... And yeah. the lack of pollution, the lack of cars on the road, the lack of things. If we choose to go back to situation normal and go back to our consumer society, then it's our fault because we've been handed the solution on a plate. The solution is that we buy less stuff that we don't need. We, we make less stuff. We don't travel in polluting economies. We don't transport goods in polluting ships or, in, or travel on planes and things like that or drive around in cars for journeys that we didn't necessarily need to, and we didn't walk as much, and we didn't make cars. The reality is that most households now have suddenly realised that they actually don't need a second car. 
for instance, mm -hmm. if you took, and the car industry, by the way, is a place I would not want to be in either. Right. If you took every second car off the road, yeah. and, and forget about whether you make it electric or not, that fact alone has had the ability to remove pollutions from our cities, which is a damn fine place to start. Because now, suddenly, the awareness of, hey, here's, here's the city that I've lived in all my life, and the, the air's never been so clear, it's never mm -hmm. been easy to breathe, it's easy to exercise now. Suddenly, we've actually, we've, we've taken that first major leap forward, and we've stopped polluting, and we've, you know, um, you know, power stations are not running that are burning coal to run electricity, the factories that aren't producing. There are ships that are not moving anywhere, there are planes that are not going anywhere at the moment that are not polluting. Um, that are not burning oil, that are not burning fossil fuels. We've now solved the problem technically if we want to. And consumers and their choices by going back to the old ways, mm. in fact, are now going to say, you know, I don't really, I care about the environment, but I don't care about it enough to do something about it. And I was handed the answer, but I chose to go back to my old ways. Or we could create a more sustainable society. Mm. Um, could we grow fruits and vegetables in our backyard? Could we find a way to grow fruits and vegetables nearer to where people live? Could we find a way to, um, instead of shipping coal overseas and burning it as fuel, could we find a way to create industries that replace that need? Could we, instead of shipping the iron ore across the world to China in, the, in mm. a ship that burns diesel and what have you, could we find a way to value add that and, and build the steel in Australia rather than shipping the ore over and then buying the finished goods back? Could we find a way to make it here? You take the cost and the pollution out of that supply chain or out of that, that distribution chain. So the question is not, can we? Yes, we can. The mm. question is, will we? And it actually comes down to individual choice for each of us as to whether you, you have that family meeting with your kids and ask them the question, do you want that, pair, that better pair of new sneakers mm. or do you want a cleaner, brighter future? Exactly right. Because I feel very passionate about that. I really do. And, um, you know, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. And to me, it wasn't about climate change. It was about environmentalism. Um, I'm more of a passionate advocate for environmentalism and having a clean, sustainable, environmentally sound world to live in. Yeah. Um, and I think the climate change thing is just honestly, it's a distraction because it's just dividing people. I think what can unite people, right? Climate change divides because there are people that believe in it and disagree. Environmentalism, yeah. can we all agree that I'd like to clean, breathe clean air? That's a much more uniting thing. And on that note, with, with say COVID-19 and that personal choice that we're going to face, what I hope happens is that people realize is that actually perhaps some of these air quality issues have been part of the problem in terms of the, um, the death tolls we've had around the world. Now, this is making a somewhat of a medical and a political statement, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, I watched a very interesting documentary by a medical doctor from Hawaii. And, he, and he, um, what was it? It was several years before this all broke out. He predicted that the um, Hubei province in Wuhan in China was going to be the place for a, uh, for a virus to break out because it had such horrible air quality. So you've got horrible air quality yep. in Wuhan, Lombardy in Italy, where it was some of the worst statistics, horrible air quality, New York, people New York. each other, subways, horrible air quality. You know, so actually, I hope that people start waking up to realize that some of the shit that's gone down is actually because we live in a polluted world and we are not looking after ourselves adequately from a healthcare point of view. So again, if you, yeah. if you, it's hard to know exactly what's going on in the States, but I wonder whether the air quality thing's a factor. I wonder whether, you know, America being one of the lowest, um, you know, healthcare um, system qualities in the world in terms of life expectancy and dependency on pharmaceuticals and all that stuff. You know, I hope that this is the pressure cooker where we go, gosh, we're not looking after our bodies. We're not looking after the environment. This caused higher death rates in certain areas of the world. Can we admit that it's not just about whether or not a virus exists? It's about the way we're looking after our environment and ourselves. Absolutely. And, and so this is the wonderful opportunity that we have, and we take it at our peril. And I, and I was going to try quite a little Literally, bit. Literally, true. Peril indeed, because people are dying as a result of it, right? In, indeed, indeed. So, so, yeah. they, so I, I don't ever want to get into a debate with somebody about the reasons why or the causes or the efficacy sure. of or the reality of you know, that because, because that's a rabbit hole of nowhere. For people. Sure. But, but, the, but the reality is that we're in, this is this, we are where we are. We now have the opportunity to act and create the future that we want to create and live in the world that we want to leave behind. Or we can go back to the one that we had where we just went business as usual. So this, this is the problem. Will we choose to act in societal best, best interest or will we choose self-interest 
of going back to situation as normal. And this is, by the way, this is the, this is, this is the real era. Mm. So the, the era of fake has gone at least temporarily because salons have been closed, fake hair, fake nails, fake tan, fake everything. It's sort of gone and people have had to get back to a level of learning, you know, learning how to uh, communicate, relationship, people talking about domestic violence rates going up and what have you. I reckon domestic violence rates would go down. And the reality, even though I'm going to upset some people by saying this because they've built their whole business or their whole life around playing upon the uh, increased domestic violence rates and therefore then creating, perpetuating it, is in fact for societies now, because husbands and wives have had to, or husbands and husbands, uh, at, or wives and wives, have had to spend time at home together, they've been forced to learn, the majority of them, to learn to communicate again. Let's, let's be honest, when a couple gets together, they can communicate, they're connected and engaged. They get driven apart by society and to some extent by people who, who benefit from them not being together. If we encourage couples to talk with each other and communicate, then we don't have domestic violence, except it's a very small minority. We don't have divorces. We don't have a legal system that plays off that. We don't have the suicide rates caused as a result of that. We don't have the asset splits and the asset raping and pillaging that happens with certain parts of the legal industry from the divorce industry. And therefore, what we have is happier, healthy societies. I'm just picking one space. Because couples are now forced to talk with each other, I think domestic violence rates will go down significantly. And I think the same is true of a whole lot of other problems. Their problems are essentially fixed and we only choose to go back to the bad behaviour. To We only have to do nothing. Sorry. We actually only have to go back to our original behaviour um, uh, for, for the problems to continue. I think almost the reality of doing nothing actually solves the problem. If we were to stop and breathe and look around and think and think about the real problems of the world and say, you know what? Instead of me working in an industry that's part of the problem, how about... I become part of the solution. So the choice is ours. It's up to us whether we um, apply ourselves to, to changing our little piece of the world or whether we leave it to society to go back to business as usual, to go back to a selfish, consumerist style, self-absorbed, absorbed in their own castle, and then actually going, you know what? I don't care really. I, I argue for climate change or against climate change, but I don't really want to do anything about it because I still want to take my kids to Disneyland. I still want to get on a plane or I still want those latest pair of new sneakers, which remember didn't just come in a box by themselves. It came in a container along with thousands of other containers on a ship that, that spewed pollution into the air. But I chose to ignore that fact. Now mm. we know that mm. it's up to us to do something about it because we've seen what the alternatives are. We've seen that we can have clear blue skies and, and you know, clean water. Yep. So, so the question not is, will we, will, will we as a society do something about it? The question is, will we as an individual, yes. will we do something about it? Will we change our behaviour? Will we choose to act in a way that benefits society rather than takes from society? Mm, I love that. And, and, I, and I very that's much the choose fundamental that. question. Yeah, I now, completely agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big believer that you know, a lot of people say you should back self-interest. And I think that's sort of true. The question is self-interest. Is, is people self-interest in the having of the short-term self-interest or is people's self-interest in the longer term about the, the question about do I really want to act in a way that damages and pollutes or do I want to act in a way that leaves the planet better than I arrived? And everybody says that they want the latter, but up until now they've behaved as the former. I'm going to bet and I'm going to build my business empire around betting on the latter is that um, for society, we'll actually um, leave the planet around better than when we found it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And yeah. And on that, on that note, you know, um, do you think there's going to be a pop up of some niches perhaps in um, self sustainability or whether it be indeed, we talked about perhaps the, there might be a trend towards regionalism, regionalism, maybe there's, um, what do you think about the niches of things like solar panels and batteries and your own land and growing things in your own garden and, and all that stuff? Okay, okay, so all right, so you've gone down an interesting path. Let's talk about food because we talked about it earlier as a driver of price. We crow about the fact that as a society in Australia that we've got 25 million people, but we grow and produce enough food for 75 million. 
we have a big enough land mass that we could produce enough food for a billion people. And by the way, if there was civil disruption in the world caused as a result of either of territory or of population growth or uh, climate events or what have you, food is going to be the, the, the catalyst yes. for a civil disobedience. Yes. Okay. If people can, people riot when they can't get enough food and they, they, they overthrow governments when they've got not enough to eat. Um, if, we, if we're a nation that, that truly cares about the rest of society, we'll stop um, the, the scenario of our economy being based on holes and homes, so the construction housing industry and digging up holes out of the ground, as opposed to the holes that sometimes run some of our companies. <laughs> um, I'll be careful how I say that. Um, but if, if, we, um, if, if we fundamentally change the nature of our society to be one that produces, then we could produce enough food to feed a billion people, knowing that in the next 15 years, there's gonna be another billion people on the planet, so there's at least a need for it, right? Fundamentally, there's gonna be a need for it. And, and instead of digging stuff out of the ground, if we value added it and produce the outcome, we don't then need to rely on importing stuff in Australia, you know, Basically, buying things that we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Who invented that? <laughs> Why are we a consumer-led society? Why are we not a productive-led society? But in order to, to create and grow food here in Australia, there are a couple of things you need. You need power. Oops, sorry. Knocked over the mic. There are power and there's water. And if you have power and water in a place, now, you can, now you've got the capability to move people to regional areas because you've got the capability to create jobs. So if you've got power and water and production, and now you've got a reason for people to be there, all you need now is to deal with the transport mechanism of allowing people to move across vast spaces. I believe fundamentally that can be fixed. Mm -hmm. So do we need, does that mean that we need to put in big solar power stations? Maybe. Do we need to put in big desal plants in regional areas so that we can irrigate them? Well, we could, although there's a wonderful desalination method called the sun. Um, back when I was about seven, I used to read science magazines and I, they talked about a desalination system, which I understand that they used in, in um, the UAE and Saudi Arabia and many countries in the Middle East for many years using the sun, where you flood an area with salt water, you let the sun do the desal and you pump out the fresh water and you use that for crop irrigation. It's sort of a no brainer. It's so you know? simple in Australia, it'd be brilliant. Absolutely brilliant during the summertime, especially. Wow. You know, that's, that, that's right. And I, I'm also told that it's, it, if we had a solar array that's 10 square kilometres by 10 square kilometres, sorry, 10, 10K by 10K or 100 square kilometres, that would be enough to power all of Australia. Okay, great. Let's put one of those in the middle of Australia so that anywhere in the middle of Australia that needs power can get it from there instead of having to get it from central Australia. The people that move out of the cities to those regions are no longer needing coal-fired power, so you've no longer got power stations that are burning fuel for people. Um, you know, it, it's a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. If we produced enough food to feed a billion people, I guarantee you we'd have no problem exporting it, because mm -hmm. there's around the world people are going to want it, and I've no doubt that we would change our society from one, and that's just one place, but we'd fundamentally change our society from being a consumer-based to a producer-based society. How, how is it yes. that places like yes. India or Bangladesh or Pakistan can produce in a very small nation with a lot more people can produce enough food for where they are to feed their nations. But we've got a, we've got a nation which has got 7.1 million square kilometres mm -hmm. and we only feed 75 million people. But Bangladesh is the size of, uh, uh, little over the size of the ACT and they feed, what's the current population of Bangladesh? It's 166 million people? It's basically, culturally, right, business culture and government policy wise, we're living like Hawaii. And what I mean by that is that we're an island nation that believes that they can just import all the time. And that costs us yeah. so much um, environmentally and also economically. Whereas um, we are indeed uh, bigger than Canada and uh, the United States of America landmass combined, and we are rich in all sorts of natural resources, including yeah. renewable energy, right? Um, so, frankly, I agree. Uh, Australia should and could be at the pivot point of becoming, uh, should we say, the glory days of the 1950s of America, where it's a producing society and it exports to the world because the rest of the world needs it. And self-sustaining, truly self-sustaining. Yeah, we pulled $165 billion worth of gold out of the ground in the 1850s yeah. and then sent that overseas. Um, that made us the richest, richest nation on earth back then. We can do the same again. It just doesn't have to be gold. 
but we have to produce in a sustainable way. But uh, we haven't got any water in Australia. We're an island, as you point out, we're an island nation surrounded by water. All we have to do is figure out how to change seawater into fresh. Not hard to do. Then we can irrigate. Then we can produce crops. Then people can live in arid areas. Then we can fundamentally change the nature of desert and the, the soil so that you can produce. And you, you know, funnily enough, the answers are already there. Mm. And so instead of selling off our agriculture to foreign investors who are going to use it to produce crops to feed their own nations, and then we get no economic benefit for that, yep. what if instead of selling off the land, we actually sold off the produce so we had the income and still owned the asset? What Absolutely a concept. Right. I mean, for example, Chinese owned cotton farms in Queensland are a primary example of that. You know, there, you know there's, there's no, they're, 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 they're actually causing problems with. Um, uh, with water irrigation and all that because it's just taking it from the places that need it the local towns and all that stuff so yeah right huh i see a funder um, in latin terra um is the word for land i believe um and the uh, and the proper latin word for uh, for australia is australis or australis or whatever yep. but it's terra australis right we have a we have an opportunity to terraform that. to terraform terra australis What's the Latin word for economy? Because we need to reform the economy. So I think, um, you know, uh, terra, terra economicus um, could be a really interesting one. I don't, I'm just making that up. I don't know if that's real. <laughs> We're spitballing new business ideas right here, but I like that. And this is the point, you know, the, these can, these times have an opportunity to not only um, shield us from future challenges, whether that be um, economic, environmental, um, viral, any of that, we need to have that um, resilience so that it doesn't affect us it doesn't affect our livelihood and that comes down to energy power water livelihood food all of that jazz and as you were saying if we can all become owners in our own economy owners in our own businesses more kind of cooperative i'm not talking about communism here i'm just talking about people like no, it's, it's, it, it's not it, at all it's economic it's capitalistic but it's for, it's for yeah. a greater motive um, I've, you know, uh, I love the idea of investing in a wind farm. I love the idea of investing in a solar panel company. I love the idea of starting a business to do that. That's all great. It's fantastic. Exactly. So, so that so changing the nature of our economy to say that that as uh, this is truly the age of the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur who creates it, and then for people who aren't entrepreneurs, and let's be honest, that's the bulk. That's most people aren't by nature, even though fundamentally go back a hundred years ago, most people did work for themselves. You look at India now, uh, I think they have 250 million entrepreneurs, the self-employed. It still represents a third of the, or a quarter of their population. Um, that's the reality is um, <coughs> we used to be, we, we don't have to be, but there's nothing to say that, that, that people who work for a business um, cannot work cooperatively and collaboratively in owning a slice of the pie, mm -hmm. in owning a slice of the value of the output, and therefore then having a say of it. And it's absolutely not communism. It's a new form of collaborative capitalism. And I actually said this is this is the um, I'm writing a book at the moment around the concept of collaborative capitalism, and I'm talking to other entrepreneurs about it because this is this next new wave that I see. Now mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I just don't think I am. I was in the building industry in 91 when the building industry collapsed. And I went from in December 1990 when I started, it was my first professional sales repping job. Um, and in six months, I went from 600 customers to 300. Cabinet makers, furniture manufacturers, kitchen manufacturers, timber yards, builders yards, architects, builders went broke. Tradesmen, the, 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 the chippies, the sparkies, the, um, the tilers, with the domino effect from them not getting paid. And then we had abandoned projects sitting there for 10 years as empty holes in the ground. Um, then, and, and that was when the, um, the building industry dropped by 10%. Well, I, I heard an interesting article yesterday on the ABC on the news and they're talking about finally someone is admitting the property prices might drop by 32%. Um, that's horrendous. But the reality is that that's going to cause a bigger building collapse, building industry collapse than in 91. And you will literally see half of the firms of that industry go out of business. Mm -hmm. um, if you have somebody who has a, a more, an average property in uh, Melbourne of $800,000 and they've got, let's say, a $600,000 $600, mortgage, if property prices drop by uh, 32% or a third, um, that would mean that their, uh, um, what, what would their equity be? They would be negative $150,000 in equity, which means they can't sell their home. Now, as long as the government protects those homeowners from the bank taking it off them, and they're able to make their mortgage repayments, it's actually not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So it's only a big deal when they go to sell it. 
that then they lose 150 grand. But we won't collapse society with a building collapse if the government stands in to protect individuals that, that are contributing. But, you know, we're, we're at risk that the GDP in Australia could literally drop 20% mm. from a positive 2.4%. So, you know, that's, that's long, long past Great Depression quality. You know, Great Depression, the, the um, economy dropped, I think it dropped to uh, 10%. Right. Um, and, and unemployment was 12%. You know, if we have a GDP drop 20 and goes to 24%, that's a lot of people out of work. So we have to fundamentally change society. It's going to be forced upon us. And we need to do it in a way that says, this is not the last pandemic. This is not the last wave of this. How do we, how do we connect and engage more with people? But at the same time, how do we not become an authoritarian state? And I think the choice is up to us as to what we do. Mm. There are answers out there if you choose to look for them. You cannot bury your head in the sand and say this is too hard because let's be honest, this is too important. Mm, very well put. We will look back on us now as the first society who had the risk of their subsequent generations being poorer than than we than our previous ones. Yes. Yes. They will look back on it on not just on that being the likelihood, but also what was the reality. Did we then therefore overcome or did we fall back to our ways and just give up and throw our hands in the air? Well, I don't know about you, but I reckon Australians are a pretty, a pretty tough, pretty resilient lot. We've just forgotten that we are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're a, we're a nation of pioneers. We're a nation of immigrants. Um, even our, our first, uh, first Nations themselves were immigrants 50, 80,000 years ago to Australia. Australia had no people in it before 50, 80,000 years, apparently. So we're all immigrants. Um, we're all pioneers and we're all a little bit larrikin. A great many of us came from, uh, from convicts and criminal stock too, by, by the way, but <laughs> not a bad thing. But the reality is that we're all, we're all new here relatively compared to other parts of the world. Therefore, whilst we don't have the history, we also don't have the stigma. We don't have to do what the rest of the world tells us to do. We actually can reform fundamentally the country if we choose to, mm. but we have to choose to. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense, Chris? It makes complete sense. And I think it's an absolutely golden opportunity for a golden age. We just need to choose it. Um, yep. Yeah, Dan, look, this, this is many words of wisdom here. So I think, you know, I want to, I'll probably wrap up the conversation here because I know you're a busy man. We need to get on with the day. But like, Dan, thank you for giving so much of the insight into um the idea of choice um both individually entrepreneurially um the idea of that there are going to be areas of growth um and that we must be conscious not to go back in our own ways um if people want to get in touch with you or either follow you online and what was what's the best kind of way for people to to stay in touch with your work so i think you're really you're leading oh. all here and it's really good i get inspired by watching your posts every single day so, so I've got 27 forms of communication. The only thing I don't have is the satellite tracking dish installed on the back of the head. But um, I mean, the, the best way to find me is I suppose on LinkedIn is to, is to, to reach out and connect and engage with me. Um, you know, it, it's pretty easy to find me. You type in that startup guy into the search engine. You'll find me somewhere on the internet, somewhere speaking. LinkedIn's a pretty easy place. I'm doing a lot of stuff now. I'm creating a whole pile of new content. We've got a new series of podcasts ourselves happening. We've already shot the first four episodes of. Um, it's a weekly thing uh, called the future of work and business. So this topic for me is, is where I live. I've got a, um, a, another podcast that I'm uh, uh, just mapping out now with my chairman called, uh, 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 not quite sure what the name is yet, but it's around the um, restore, regrow, renew, uh, repurpose your business style thing is how do you, how do you change your existing business to, to recover? or maybe it's Recover, Restore, Renew. Um, and then there's a series of other content pieces we want to do too. We've got a training program coming over. We've got a, a VC fund that we're working on now, uh, which is about investing in people with good ideas, but we're doing it in a way that is a little bit innovative and a bit disruptive. Uh, I mentioned the Venture Studio model as, the, as, a, as a much less risky model for people who are aspirationally entrepreneurial, but don't necessarily have the skills. And we've got some training coming along for people to help them be able to do that. Um, and I'm not interested in doing these high cost training models or I'm not, um, I'm not a coach. I'd like to think that I'm a mentor and an investor and a collaborator. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all about trying to enable people. So you, when you say that you've got to put your money where your mouth is, 
Um, so you won't, you won't find me with a $10,000 course. <laughs> you, might, you might find me with a $100 a month subscription fee for a program that helps you become a great entrepreneur. Um, and we'll see if that comes to fruition. But in reality, um, what I would say to people in closing is if you have a dream and if you have a vision and if you're aware of somebody's pain and how to be able to take that away, then that's pretty much all you need to get started. Share that vision with people and say, here's what I see and here's what I can do about it. The right people that can help and support you will join you on that journey. Um, all you have to become is a little bit of an evangelist for and a better outcome than we have now, which is all I like to think that I am, is I'm an evangelist for better outcomes. And if you can do that with your thing, then you can change your family's future. You can fundamentally change the nature and society, uh, society of Australia, one household at a time, starting with your own. So that's the final message I'd leave. If people are thinking about how do I actually make a difference and I'm struggling and I'm what have you, it's just don't try and change the world. Solve one problem, one household at a time. And eventually enough people will catch on that, that they'll come and join you and help you do it. That's, I suppose, how you build replicable, scalable systems to, uh, uh, to change fundamental problems of the world. That's that. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Daniel Mumby, that startup guy, it's been a pleasure having you on today. And uh, if you've enjoyed listening to this episode, please remember to hit subscribe. And uh, Dan, I look forward to having a chat with Absolutely. very near in future with you once again. Thanks for having me, Chris. Cheers. Pleasure.